Welcome to Show Studio's live panel discussions. In these discussions, all experts from all parts of the industry discuss and debate the most important fashion week shows of the season. Today, to round up London Fashion Week, we're going to be looking at Fashion East Autumn Winter 2021. My name's Amy Delahaye, I'm a curator and writer, and I work as a professor at London College of Fashion. Um, Olivia, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, okay. Um, my name's Olivia Dean. I'm a singer-songwriter from East London. And um, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's me pretty much. Harry? Hi, I'm Harry Freegard. I'm a designer and director, and I spend my time procrastinating and making a mess. Sydney? <laughs> Hi, I'm Sydney. I'm a writer and documentary filmmaker from London. Um, today we're going to be talking about um, Fashion East. Um, as many listeners, most listeners will be aware, it's a non-profit designer um, support and showcasing scheme which was founded by Lulu Kennedy in 2020. And her talent for spotting and nurturing future fashion talents has really transformed and regenerated London's reputation as a centre for innovative radical and challenging fashion design. Fashion East has been instrumental in launching the careers of scores of really top level international fashion designers like um, Kim Jones, J.W. Anderson, Art School, um, Wales Bonner, Charles Jeffrey Loverboy, Simone Rocha, Craig Green and many more. Um, in the 1980s, London was, um, the designers were radical, they were politicized, there was a big sort of club and queer scene and it was really, really exciting, which is when I was at the Royal College and was the time of my youth. I feel that perhaps, you know, it's, it's regained that momentum and sense of excitement again now. Um, not only are the designs incredibly innovative and challenging, but maybe more than ever before, the industry has become increasingly politicised and London has really regained its reputation for um, sustainability for queer style for club style um, for diversity for inclusivity and all of these momentums were certainly happening before covid but maybe covid has really propelled them um, even more so today we're going to look at the work of the five showcase designers um, that lulu kennedy and her panel um, selected which are juar juare elaine maximilian davis Nenzi Dojaka, Goom Heo, um, and Hannah Hopkins, um, accessory level HRH. Rather than presenting a filmed show, um, this season the designers um, provided a lookbook and they made a film each. So it was quite disparate, but maybe it gave them an opportunity to really um, convey the mood or the ethos um, or the politics of their own collections. Um, and I'd like now to ask what are the real experts um, about what they thought about, if we talked about firstly the way the designers showed their collections, um, what you thought of the format, the film and the look back book format. Mm. I love the film. I thought the film just really speaks to the culture that Fashionista is trying to like create and is creating and this has been creating for so long in London fashion. And it, it is taking us behind the scenes immediately. We see rainbows strutting down the little runway. It's so good. I thought it was, I thought it was gorgeous. I was really loving, uh, there was a particular Ariana Grande remix at one point. <laughs> <laughs> I was there enjoying that. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's a great, it's a great, uh, it's a great film. And, and I think it's a great, great way to show the collection. I mm. think, I suppose what struck me is the humanity of it. Mm. I grew up in an era where you know, fashion was, however radical and political, it still was really elitist. The designers weren't collegiate. Um, and it still had that kind of auteur, that sort of, you know, like, you know, you wanted to go to the Comte de Gasson shop in South Moulton Street or whatever, and you had to ring the bell. And it was, you know, it was a different era. This felt, I don't know, it's, it's got all the edge of fashion, but it's got a kind of inclusivity and a humanity that I don't think I've ever seen before. Mm. It feels more tangible, I think. Seeing real people and the people that actually make it are the part of it and getting to getting to see them even for a second, a little glimpse inside, it's, it's the reality of fashion. I think it punctures through that, that veil of the fantasy a little bit. We get to see it, it's real people, it's real clothes. This is what's happening. Take it or leave it. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's quite raw and kind of like it's it's just punky, isn't it? And that mm. kind of remind that kind of for me is like the fashion east ethos to a degree. Yeah, it feels accessible for me even. Like I wouldn't class myself as someone that knows a lot about high fashion and fashion, but watching this, I felt like, yeah, as you said, it was human and accessible and like I could be a part of it. I think it's interesting that you use the term high fashion because I've used that term like my whole life or old adult life as high fashion as opposed to mainstream fashion. Mm. Um, and now I almost feel the high is kind of being lost because the price point is always going to be high and only available to a few. But that real sort of cultural elitism and exclusivity, which fashion thrived on for so long, that's all being eroded. Um, and I also get the feeling that certainly my generation, like at the Royal, people who went to the Royal College or whatever, the big dream was, you know, to be like Galliano or McQueen and go to Paris and work for one of the big conglomerates. And now I wonder if it's like there are different dreams, and I don't think I don't think that's the all desirable dream. It's the burnout sort of, you know, working for a big capitalist organization who's obviously foregrounding money. Whereas now there seems to be more emphasis on, I don't know, maybe smaller scale designers keeping control of what they do, mm. um, really maintaining their political integrity, um, whether it's about, you know, cultural identity or sexuality or, you know, insisting on having things made locally. Um, so the feels are sort of, I think it's maybe more inclusive and human, but there's also I don't know, I suppose integrity wasn't a word that in the past you would particularly have associated with fashion and maybe, <laughs> I don't know what you think, if maybe it's not losing its fun or being outrageous, but there is a sort of integrity perhaps. Certainly, I think it, I think authenticity is so important in fashion and standing behind your word. I think we've seen an abundance of people doing the whole sustainable thing, but not actually doing the sustainable thing. Exactly. Um, and I think that just speaks to inauthenticity. I think what we see here in Fashion East is a bunch of authentic people making what they want to make and standing behind it. I agree. It's convincing, isn't it? Mm. It's not talking the talk. Um, and it's not travelling half the way around the world to show your sustainable credentials. Yeah which is one of the things that COVID has obviously forced as well. Um, and it's shown people that they can do things. You know, they can stay local and, you know, mm. you don't need to travel. You don't need to get on a plane to see shows. Um, it makes you wonder what will happen. You know, what is the future of it? But also it's been quite interesting that in the past where Fashion East had men's wear and women's wear. And I think since last year, um, they've shown collections together, which means that that's, sort of emphasis on a binary has gone and now it's much more sort of fashion for people mm. um, and I thought that came through um, maybe not in Nancy's collection so much but certainly in the others. Mm. Yeah I think Nancy's was fabulous though didn't you? Oh, so, why? so gorgeous I think it was so confident I think she really knows herself knows her designs and just to your point of how um, people are standing behind what they do and and uh, not running off to doing a big house or anything. E I agree with you, but equally, I could I could see her running away and doing a big house. Could she just step into Mugler immediately and, and take over? I could see her doing that. Absolutely, or even I was thinking, um, there's also something a bit about a liar. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. I'd love to see they Nancy. Still, <laughs> there's still clothes that were shown on tiny bodies. Mm. Um, but there was one long dress that an older person or a person with a slightly different body type might have worn. Yeah, that's the thing of that collection. It's like, I was going to say, like, I really would love to wear it all, but I just feel like I would have to lose a lot of weight to wear it, which is kind of not very inclusive of the current like time. Yeah, God help the rest of us, if that's how you <laughs> I thought Jess maybe looked amazing in it, though. She's not exactly tiny, tiny, wayfish woman. She's a full-bodied okay. gal, which is fabulous. Yes, yeah, some of them, yeah. Um, is there something that you'd like to discuss or would you like to say maybe which, if there was a designer whose work that you just felt was really quite special? Me? Um, anybody. <laughs> um, I, I really want the men to say the, the dresses I love. I just worry about laddering. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
I wonder what that material is actually. All of those like knotted yeah. tights and the leggings. I'm wondering what that actually is. I've shot some of her dresses before, and they were they were great in person. I had no worry about laddering. But those really? tights and those leggings, I do wonder what even is I it. Think that they needed stockings, but they had sort of had apertures that were ruched around. Mm. That's a technical feat of making, isn't it? Mm. They're um, really they're really great. Yeah. yeah, I would say that these this designer is my favourite and maybe the one I'd be most likely to wear. I mean, when we can go out again, not just in my house, but like <laughs> when we can go out again, I just feel like these dresses are so flattering and I feel like they're the most ones I'd most likely be to put on my body. I think I that think suit I as well um, is particularly, uh, I could see myself wearing I that. love that suit from her. Yeah. I thought that was a great development from her last collection, seeing some tailoring from Nancy. Yeah, I agree. Really interesting. And I, I love the casting as well. I thought the hair on this girl that's showing now with that the, the little dread moment, that was so good. I thought the casting was so pretty with uh, Flo and um, Jess as well. And I just think she knows her woman. She knows this like sexy, powerful, it's the ultimate LBD. It is, it's the liar of today. You know, mm. it's, 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 yeah, I think I just kept thinking it's it's different, but it's it's channeling the same kind of feel. Sensitive but risque. Yes. <laughs> um, well, should we move on to Jawara Alain's collection? Um, mm. sure. He studied at LCF and then went to St Martin's to do menswear. Mm. Um, I think I think this was the first time he's shown at Fashion East. Yes, this is his debut, I believe. And uh, I, I thought the styling was really fabulous. I thought it was a really strong collection. Um, I really liked it. Um, mm. I like. I thought that yeah, this it was kind of amusing, but the styling and it had all these cultural references that different people would pick up on. But you know, it's like this Hollywood glamour. There's the heightened masculinity of gay style from the 1980s, um, with all the sort of chaps and cowboy boots. Um, and then there was some incredible fabric, and I didn't know if it was metallic. It looked like lush tropical leaves. Um, oh. It was a classic. That, sorry, that's the thing with like how, uh, watching it through videos that you can't kind of kind of grasp what the, mm. the the fabrics as well. No, and that is the real thing that you know. I know clothing sales online are good at the moment, but when it, you're never ever going to be, you know, the exact colour tone, the materiality, the sort of haptic qualities, we can't ever convey that. Um, so yeah, we can't see the fabrics. I didn't know if it's it's shiny, but it's certainly lush. Mm. Um, Definitely what I miss about fashion shows as well is um, seeing how they move, seeing everything yeah. happening and moving and walking along. Yeah. But I thought this was an interesting collection because it's quite, um, I mean, all of our work is always autobiographical to some extent, but um, Joara was born in Jamaica, wasn't he? And grew up in the Cayman Islands and then came to London. And the collection sort of, I don't know, it sort of had a carnivalesque, especially in terms of the styling feel. Um, and it sort of explores different or perceptions of masculinities, I suppose. Mm. And he's talked about how difficult it is, you know, being a gay man growing up um, in the Caribbean. Um, and then he said about something I read somewhere about him saying something like he, when he came to London, the only limit was his imagination, which is the most amazing tribute to kind of fashion cultures of London, the art school education that, you know, and in the eighties there was the art school training, but there wasn't a lot after it. Um, but now with Fashion East, you know, young designers don't fall down the hole in a way that all those amazing designers like Body Map and things did in the eighties, where, you know, they'd got orders, they'd got amazing collections, but they weren't nurtured or supported. And the government paid for them to go to art school. When we did, we got paid at that time. We got our fees paid and our um, grants. <laughs> But afterwards, that was it. Um, and a lot of them simply didn't survive. Mm. And so what Lulu Kennedy's done, you know, over a sustained period of 20 years is really, it really is a tribute and how one person in a really small, and a small team have really, the way they've enriched London fashion is quite extraordinary and its global reputation. Mm. Indeed, they're integral to the London fashion scene. I can't imagine Fashion Week in London without Fashion East. You see, I can because I'm younger than you. I remember what it was talking about. Um, but, um, I was going to say, what's the reference with the uh, the, the uh, fencing sword? That I don't know. 
I was getting quite like um, highwaymen, you know, it's quite camp, elegant highwaymen. Yes, and pirates, because he's quite interested in like pirate imagery. So mm -hmm. yeah, it might be a, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think it might be that. I love that. I love that he's doing pirate because I was getting a bit of, um, for me, it's a compliment, but I was getting a bit of RuneScape. It was making me think of RuneScape. Well, the, the, the online, uh, the online uh, yeah. game. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> that, like orangey, I think it's orange, no, it's like a yellowy top that cuts in like a waistcoat thing and then like orangey tan trousers. It was very RuneScape to me. I loved it. <laughs> it's like default pair in RuneScape. <laughs> Need to bring it back, RuneScape. Yeah, really into it. Um, talking about Fashion East, um, I was talking to a colleague, Jonathan Fires, who did Fashion at St. Martin's in the 80s. And at the time they picked, you know, they picked who went in the shows. And he said that all the most radical designers at this time weren't picked. And so they went off to Chenille Galleries in the King's Road and they set up an alternative show and it was called No Sacrifice. Um, and then at the St. Martin's show, they came and scattered leaflets for No <laughs> Sacrifice and ended up getting masses and masses of publicity. Um, and it was just like a sort of renegade um, spin-off, but they got masses of um, publicity. And then I, it just started making me think that Fashion East was sort of the grown-up, organised version of that. Because you've got really London Fashion is. And then you'd got, you'd got the breakaway sort of, you know, radical up-and-coming designers. Um, but, but in this instance, they were actually supported and nurtured. Mm. For sure. No, I think that's definitely, I, that reminds me of a story of, um, I didn't, I, I love learning that, that you, you just said that, because I know that um, Delara did a similar thing a few years ago as well, where, where it was like the encore CSM about the press shirts at Martins, where all the, all the designers not picked kind of rallied, rallied together, got a bunch of press and did their own thing. Oh, I didn't know that. History. There's a history. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of disruptors. And I think yeah. that's what Fashion East does, putting focus and funds and support into disruptors and people doing new things, which I think is so important. Uh, fashion gets so stale and so just wrapped up in itself. I think putting focus, putting funds, putting support with the disruptors and then keeping this shit going, making more exciting things happen. Yeah, and what a tribute to Britain's art schools, because it still is the art schools that you know, St. Martin's London College of Fashion, the art schools up and down the country. It still is the art schools that are the breathing ground for most um, of our designers. And it is a unique system. And partly why it's unique is because it has a sort of contextual studies component where, you know, when I was curator at the V&A, John Galliano came and looked at the collections, but he, he did that because he'd been taken as a student to mm. do it. Um, and so they have this incredible wealth of sort of historical and and now more and more culturally diverse references um, that I think does distinguish it from, you know, other fashion capitals, masses of fashion capitals there are now. Mm. Undoubtedly. Who's our next gal? I was loving um, Miss Goom Hio's. Goom Hio, absolutely. Love. Um, the, the eyes, the eyes on the sleeves, the signature, because I know she's always, around St. Martin's, you'll find um, these like eyes that she did spray painted all around the building from years ago. It's kind of her signature. And I just love seeing that on the little, she's still carrying on. I love that. I think that's authentic, just to bring that little trope through, keep carrying that thread along. Yeah, and, and it's quite sort of surreal, sort of Jean Cocteau-esque. Mm. And Scaparelli in the 1930s, the amazing designer who worked with Salvador Dali, who was did lots of sort of surreal inspired fashions, um, used the eye um, a lot. I thought they were really interesting. I mean, I think I, they're technically complex, aren't they? Mm. As well as, I think they're very, very wearable, but it's very rare that a designer um, creates maybe a new sort of silhouette or a new a sort of variant of... That's quite a, a Kylie Minogue, uh, can't get you out of my head look with oh, the... Uh, it so <laughs> is. <laughs> I and love that like one. The knit and the uh, black and white. Is it a knit? Again, can't really tell in the photos. Uh, I think uh, it's, I think it's a, a, an open knit layered over like a printed leggingy thing. I think. Yeah, it's like leggings with a zigzag, black and white zig white zag, print with a very fine knit mm. uh, over the top, which actually are really wearable and you can see that being picked up and mm. adapted and copied um now I thought her work was really interesting I think that looked particularly um you know it's quite an unusual silhouette it almost reminded me of sort of 
sort of historical, those sort of curvy menswear breeches and, mm. um, but then also lampshades. It sort of had a... <laughs> Speaking of lampshades, I wish we had a little light on this though, because I think yeah, exactly. like, I can't see anything. <laughs> I think we saw more in the video. It's very yeah. difficult to see, especially if you've got glasses. <laughs> and what did strike me when, because we saw the collections quite separately in a way, um, is that when you look at them together, the absence of colour. It's nearly all black, mm. a bit of white, and then odd accents. Um, That's fine with me. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, 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 it's brilliant colour. But I wondered if that is some sort of sign of the time. And then I was quite interested as well that, um, like all COVID, we've all got used to wearing face masks over our mm. nose and mouth. And then, who was it? Was it um, Chihuahua? Um, who had the gold, go which designer was oh, it? Oh, Max, goggles? Max and Millian Davis did Max the goggles. Million. They were like sort of diving goggles. And it's like mm. we were shifting the focus from here mm. to here. And it's, but it's still about protection. I felt a lot of the clothes, um, with the exception of Nancy, but they're very much about, they're still about covering up and protection and mm. creating yeah. an interface between. It's like the very sexy and... PPE, that look. With the I, very... goggles. <laughs> I, think they're I could see Nomi at the airport wearing that, couldn't you? Nearly wiping down her airplane seat in this like yeah, hazmat her, suit. Her, her <laughs> wife. Should we move on to Maximilian? Yes, please. Um, my favourites. Oh uh, yeah, I thought they were amazing. And um, Olivia, will you say what you thought? I think the look with the the white look with the sort of black detailing on it is my favourite. It's my like favorite. a kind of flame motif, isn't it? Yeah, I love where it is on the knees, like the position of it, like they're sort of forming the circle when they're together. I think that's so interesting. I would definitely wear this as a whole, whole piece there. I love it. And but with the goggles, of course. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it must have the goggles. <laughs> what did you think, Sydney? Um, I mean, I think the four was very impactful. I think that like for me is like the most standout look of the of it all. Um, I, I can't. Is it like a? Is that kind of a, a nylony uh, tight or so, or, or is it more rubber? Because the the scuba thing kind of makes you think it's like a rubber look, but it's it's probably more nylony or not nylony, but um, it's gonna be stretch. Yeah, mm -hmm. stretch. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty pretty impactful. Harry, what did you think? I loved it. I love this little uh, suit against the green. The man in the little uh, short short cropped suit. I thought was really adorable. Um, I also loved the the jumpsuit that was happening, that like stretchy kind of like, uh, I don't, it was giving me a bit of like an elvis -y moment, jumpsuit with the red cuffs. I loved that. And I thought he also had um, the best manicure. The, the, the nails by Sylvie McMillan were so good. Like this kind of like weird, like glow in the dark looking ochre, maybe clear nail, I thought was quite genius. I thought it was quite a quiet collection. I thought it was quite a quiet stoic collection. With um, a few pops, few shouts. Yeah, I think as our, as I'm the resident historian, um, to me, I saw references from the late 1960s space age. Mm. It reminded me the of Barbarella. The, yeah, Barbarella, Courage, Ungaro, um, Pierre Cardin, um, and also then it started making me think that it was a particular point of time, like in the late 1960s, where there was this huge belief in technology and the power of technology to improve lives for the better. And then there was a massive, massive backlash against it. And that's when we got all the sort of like hippie and sort of peasant, mm. not, not right and road anymore, but sort of in different sort of um, complete reaction against it. Um, so yeah, it was quite futuristic, I thought. Mm. So that hat, the white hat with the massive sort of yeah. That felt like a bit different from the rest of the collection mm. to me. Like that was very, I don't know, less stoic, I guess, and a bit more standout than the rest of it. Kind of yeah. Yeah, I, I love really that really look. And didn't Rihanna wear it recently? Or am I imagining that? I could see her wearing it. <laughs> yeah, I could see her wearing it. I think she was <laughs> I see her wearing it very well. I know that <laughs> Naomi's just worn his hat from last season on the cover of ID, I believe. What was this? What also happened last season? Big feathery number. Okay. Let's see if we can see it. Quite share. Oh yeah! Uh, wow. 
everyone, so, I think ID's posted it. Wow, that's amazing. Ray Peacock. Mm. Yeah, I want one. And um, should we move on to HRH, which is um, mm. Mm. accessories? Um, yes, for sure. Super cute. I like the way the photographs were styled. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you thought. I think the the bag on the neck, like the necklace ones in the bag is just so like creative. I haven't seen anything like that myself or personally. Like how amazing to like, have your little stuff in your bag, like when you're going out. I think they're so great. And the scrunchies, the massive scrunchies and the colors are so great. But also is it for, I was thinking that now we're doing everything online like the focus is like from here upwards so it's like are we all going to invest in things that we wear sort of from the waist up so like you know, yeah. you're not you're taking your handbag out anymore so you have a micro one and wear it around your neck yes that's so interesting i love that and how micro are these bags in real life like what could what can you put in them airpods airpods <laughs> but like a computer tiny um i don't know if you could put your phone in them no, they I, think, I think they're smaller than, than an iPhone. Yeah, they look micro. Yeah. And, and the way they interface with the body is quite interesting. But yeah, they, they, they're actually, they're probably less functional than a pocket even and smaller. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm all for that. I'm a huge uh, wearer of tiny useless bags. I have an abundance of them that don't fit phones, barely fit a credit card. But there's just something about them, just this, just the objet. It's like an art in, its, in itself, accessories. I think they're gorgeous. And I think her being part of Fashionist, I think it's lovely because they had Anka Saka being their resident accessories uh, designer. And now, now that she's kind of graduated from Fashionist, we're having another accessory designer come on in. I think it's really lovely to see that. Yeah, just I do too. And it really is a different type of bag. That's what I really liked. It's like a shift away from those hugely expensive you know, tens of thousands of pounds um, designer mags, you know, made from leather and fabrics that aren't always sustainable. And mm. um, when you were saying, Harry, about how you like wearing them, I think what intrigues me about wearing them is, I know we're seeing them sort of static and I was saying about sitting here, but actually it's the way they interface with the body and they change the silhouette. I think that becomes, that they're really quite interesting in that sense, aren't mm. they? They, mm. they the way you walk and, um, yeah, and they change your silhouette. And one of the pictures, um, I think it's the one on the top left or the top right, I like the way they've been styled because they're really modern, but the styling is also like slightly 19th century. It's like they're a bit bonnety and there's a ruched sort of thing that looks a bit like a bustle. And mm -hmm. yeah, I was really interested in them. And then I I didn't know a lot about her work. So I went off and did some a little bit of research and she um, is a costume designer and does work uh -huh. for um, sort of the music industry and commercials and some film. And it it kind of fell into place a bit. Mm. I can see that, especially yeah. in that ruching. Yes. Yeah, so because it's, I, I wrote down ruching when I saw it. And then I saw, um, I saw some fashion notes about it and it said scrunches. And I thought, oh, it's completely different references. Because <laughs> <laughs> scrunches like sportswear and, and it, they are quite sporty too, aren't they, in a way? Mm. But it's it's funny this kind of uh, the dichotomy between sport and utility, and then this kind of like useless aesthetic gorgeousness of a tiny little bag. It's quite, it's quite funny the contradiction. Oh, my bag's just going to keep getting smaller then. I hope so. I, have the, I, hope so. <laughs> I feel like it encourages you to travel light. Just <laughs> your house. You don't need your phone. You don't need your card. You just need I don't know <laughs> whatever you carry. One one singular key. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I love that. I think I you think, I think handbags, are, it's just like having a brooch or something. It's like an interruption or an embellishment to an outfit. I don't think it really needs to be useful in any sense, as long as you can hold it and it looks nice. And there we go. I mean, they're crossing more into like, as accessories, they're cross crossing into more kind of jewellery-esque than they are hmm. as an actual, yeah, some you, you, utility? What's the right word? Yeah. Um, when you, having seen the shows um, and these collections, what does it make you think about, I mean, it's always awful when people say what's gonna happen in the future, but in the, the near future, like what do you think, what, what is gonna happen at Fashion East in the next year or two? Will they go back to doing shows? Mm -hmm. What do you mm -hmm. think will happen? I hope so. 
hopes. Yeah, I want to see what the materials are. Yeah, I think everyone will be kind of dying to be back at shows and be in the room with people. And as you were saying, see how the clothes move. I feel like more than ever, people are gonna go, gonna want to be off screen and in person. I feel like it'll go completely other direction. I don't think. And so, do you think we're going to go back to a world where people are flying all around the world again? You know, maybe, you know, for two days somewhere and then two days somewhere else. Because there's a big backlash against that now, isn't there? Maybe that, perhaps not. Maybe it'll probably stay more like in London if you're in London or in Paris if you're in Paris. And yeah, I think people will be a bit more skeptical or maybe look down. I guess it's even more for flying about loads, but I feel like definitely people will want to be in person. Mm. Yeah, but then your generation is incredibly, I mean, I'm wonderfully politicized. Yeah. If brands are like trying, to, if, if everyone's kind of pushing the sustainability thing, I mean, it's kind of flawed for everyone to go back to how it was with everyone flying about. I mean, I think there'll be like a push for there being kind of a, it'd be more of a, uh, like necess- if there was a necessity for people to do that but I don't think there is anymore and I think it's been proven that you know you can you can push with all these visuals and stuff instead they might be they might go the way that they combine both the visuals and like some people in attendance but like using that kind of using the video and the film aspect more maybe I don't know I think designers are itching to get it back in real life I think I think I think yeah I think there's so many benefits doing this digital thing, but I think designers are itching for in, in life, real life, showing off their stuff. I think that's what they work for. I think there's almost like an anti-climax when designers, they work away and do all this stuff and then they have the video and it comes out and they're just, well, I mean, I've, I've bear witness to it. I've, I live with a designer who did that exact thing and releases a video and then it's just kind of like, okay, like it's great and it's exciting, but it's it doesn't compare to being real life in a show and having a million people around and, I think fashion's just chomping at the bit to get back to that. Yeah, and there is a performativity which is critical, isn't there? Mm. Indeed. It's, it's so necessary in fashion, I think. Well, it has been at least. Absolutely. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to say about um, Fashion East? I, well, I think they're doing a really great job. I love what they're doing. I think they're persisting and throughout this pandemic and keeping things going and keeping designers, like bringing in new designers to launch during a pandemic sounds a bit nuts, really. But it, they're they're still out there. The designers are out there. Let's give them some support and let's get this thing going. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's a real tribute to um, the dedication and absolute commitment of mm. the community. I mean, extraordinary. Yeah, I think she gives hope. So do I, and I think her commitment demonstrates, you know, she she leads by example. She's completely committed to supporting young designers and and she does it, you know, it's, so she's the real deal. Yeah. Yeah, I look forward to going to an actual show. Um, yeah, I do too, I must say. I would have loved to see all of this in person, honestly but it's it's a brilliant collection and I, and I really enjoyed it visually the way that I could enjoy it but yeah I can't wait till we can go back to normal and I don't know it's, it's a bit more visceral mm. and touch it and, and see it <laughs> is there anything else or should we round up is there anything I've forgotten to ask that you were desperately wanting to say <laughs> I don't think so I can't think of anything well, it's been an absolute treat to meet you all and talk with you. Thank you. Um, so thank you to all the panellists and thank you all for watching. For more extensive Fashion Week coverage, be sure to visit showstudio.com. And if you're watching via Show Studios YouTube, be sure to like, comment and subscribe below. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye. Ciao.